Hello and welcome to our channel, Marstream, your public performance broadcast platform. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can also donate to our tip jar and support the arts and artists in Marstream by clicking the link below in the description. Check out our website at themarsh.org for all upcoming live performances. Now enjoy the show. I'd like to welcome Candace Johnson. Candace, so just give us a brief biography of yourself. <laughs> know who you are. So I am Candace Johnson. I am a, a lyric coloratura soprano trained classically, but I sing uh, jazz, musical theater, uh, spirituals. I teach voice at UC Berkeley. Um, I am uh, a researcher, an actress, pianist, um, music lover, and I'm so happy to be a part of The Marsh. You've been an amazing part of The Marsh before and during this Marsh stream. And you've even doing something a little bit wild. Teach. What do you teach on Marsh Stream every Friday? Every Friday. How could I forget? I teach fitness singing, which is a combination of a group voice lesson with a little bit of fitness workout. Um, and we have a great time. We're building a wonderful community. We have people who are popping in from all over the country. Um, and we're learning music and moving our bodies and having a great time. It's a wonderful class. I go to it sometimes. Um, but the thing that we're doing is it comes, I think, a little bit out of a workshop that um, you and I are both in, along with uh, Wayne Harris and Catherine Keats, um, Maggie Wilson, which is the Marsh's solo performance, solo performance musical wor workshop, okay. which has been developing solo performance musicals. And out of this comes what you are working on this weekend, which is this, it's a, um, a series you created. You wanna tell a little bit, tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Well, definitely um, the workshop has helped, helped me as an artist um, start to find how I can bring all the different components of my passions um, together on the stage in this uh, solo performance format. Um, so this this series is going to focus on the the art songs of black composers. And then this first installment is specifically going to focus on a song cycle by Adolphus Hale Stork. And that song cycle is titled Ventriloquist Acts of God. And so why did you want to do this? Well, um, so when I was a chancellor's postdoc, and actually even before that, when I, when I was um, working on my dissertation recitals, I was really, really passionate and continue to be passionate about uh, disseminating the art songs, the vocal songs of uh, black composers. And um, so this really is an outgrowth of my dissertation recital work, um, my postdoctoral uh, research, and um, I just continue to want to share not only the music, but I want people to know about the lives of the black composers, the poetry that is used um, and how we can even see uh, social historical context within the frame of the music. So you are going to be doing a number of these. How many did we decide you wanted to do? Was it four or was it five? <laughs> Well, I think the jury's still out. I, I think I definitely have five, um, five inside of me. Um, another composer that I am looking forward to focusing on um, is Margaret Bonds, another Undine Smith Moore. Um, uh, let's see, oh, Ollie Wilson. And I probably will combine Ollie Wilson with another composer, but uh, perhaps Jackie Hairston. That those are two Bay Area composers. Ollie Wilson is deceased, um, but certainly left his mark, not just here in the Bay, but across the world in terms of scholarship on the black composer. And you pick though to start with Adolphus Hale Stork. Why is that? Yes, I did. I chose um, Adolphus's work because it's one of the one of the cycles 
that I feel closest to. Um, it's one that I spent a lot of time digging into to understand uh, the gestures, to find the motives, um, the text painting, to understand how he sets poetry. Um, what is his tonal language? What are his rhythmic tendencies in vocal songs? So um, definitely, I love Hale Stork, and he just knows how to sing the voice. <laughs> that alone makes me love him. We have we we were hoping to have Adolphus on here, but he's in the East Coast and he just had his 80th birthday and this was too late for him. <laughs> so we did do some interviewing with him, which was wonderful. So Adolphus, I, many of our people might not know a lot about you. Can you tell us a little bit? You're like, I think you just celebrated a big birthday. Is that true? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I had a little birthday party. <laughs> I mean, uh, some people threw one for me and I had, it was the big, biggest and greatest Zoom meeting uh, in this composer's life. Uh, as to early stuff, you know, I, I started out in the public school system and I came up through an Episcopal cathedral and a uh, very high church Anglo-Roman uh, cathedral and um, the, the Anglican tradition of, of boys and men's choirs. And then I uh, had a fabulous, went to a fabulous high school where they had a very strong music program. And then uh, went to Howard where they had a fabulous choir the, the years I was there. And uh, then studied with Boulanger for a summer. And then uh, went to Manhattan School of Music, one of the great opportunities of my life and experiences. And then uh, did a couple years in the army and came out and I heard that a guy named Dr. Martin Luther King had a doctorate, but I never heard of an academic doctorate. And when I said, well, if he got a doctorate and, and he had a, he was a great inspiration. I said, I think I'll go get an academic doctorate after what am I gonna do with a master's degree in music composition, no teaching certificate, nothing. So. Okay, I'll get a doctor. And then I can teach in a college 15 to 20 hours a week or so, maybe less than that. And then I can write music. And that's what I've done all my life. I started writing uh, in the 50s as a high school student, and I never stopped. It was uh, 60 years I've been at this now. So tell us a little bit about what was your first thing you wrote that got played and what was that like for you and how old when I, when I first was getting played what was the first piece of music you loved and that actually got into the world someone made oh um yeah oh that's got an interesting story too it's a piece called celebration a little a three and a half minute piece for a symphony orchestra um thor johnson was the conductor of the nashville symphony he was asked he was by uh, the jc penny company the board of directors, uh, well, actually the chairman, to uh, put together some boxes of music to be distributed at every high school in the country uh, to celebrate uh, the bicentennial. And he was allowed to do the orchestra box uh, to give out one commission. And he gave it to me and I called it Celebration. It was supposed to be for high school choir, a uh, high school orchestra. Of course, the thing is, when you're studying at a conservatory like Manhattan School of Music, they don't teach you to write for high school orchestra. You're writing for the New York Philharmonic, just down the street of it. And uh, so it, 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 what happened is it became a hot number with, as an opener with, uh, for uh, symphony orchestras, professional symphony orchestras. And um, it has hung on, uh, it, once in a while it still gets played, but anyway, the frequency of that performance, of that piece being performed, uh, led to my name getting around and other people were asking me if I like to write other pieces, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's how it really got started. Mozart, Mozart's 600 compositions. Okay, I want 300 at least. And I, and I have done that. Now I'm over, I'm up to about 310. And uh, I was looking for my chronological list here. I always have a chronic, chronological list handy. And, um, it consists of everything. Uh, I, I, I jokingly say that I've written for everything so far except a kazoo and, a, and an accordion. Um, I have written for everything. So uh, it's always fun. So anything
Well, Adolphus is quite an amazing man and what he's done and he's such a personable, energetic, let us all be like this. Let us live to 80 and be all like Adolphus who's still going strong. Okay. And I think, why don't we do another one right now? Um, let's, um, let's now uh, broadcast the Adolphus on identity. And you say you're multicultural. What are you? What do you mean by being multicultural? Well, I'm, I'm uh, trained in my training. Uh, I'm strongly Euro-American uh, in my training. I mean, I grew up on Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, the whole nine yards. And um, I grew up in upstate New York. Where, Adolphus? Where, Adolphus? Albany. I'm from Newburgh. Oh, yeah? Okay. I was born in Rochester, raised in Albany. And uh, raised uh, 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 with the classics, and um, then uh, I certainly embraced uh, the heritage that was available to me when I went to Howard University in DC, and that fabulous choir, learning the spirituals, the whole nine yards, and so I work with both. Sometimes I call myself a cultural hybrid. Uh, some of my pieces are strictly, as much as I can, uh, ethnically oriented in, in terms of African-American musical idioms. Some pieces use none of that. Other pieces uh, blend the two. I, I will blend them in, in, in a single piece. And some pieces I juxtapose them in a single piece. I don't like the idea of being put in a box so that anybody says, oh, you're a black composer, you're right, jazz and gospel. No, you know, no, no, I, that's not me. Um, but at the same time, I can write jazz and gospel. <laughs> and I do use them sometimes. I, I didn't grow up in a black church. I didn't come up in a black church. I came up in the Anglican cathedral. I came up in white society, totally. Uh, and um, the, uh, the, the style characteristics that other African-American composers may have picked up from going to a black church was not part of my learning. If you didn't see me, you have no way of knowing if I'm black or if I'm white. I don't, I'm not, I'm not from the ghetto. I didn't come up speaking the brogue. Uh, there's no family member that I lived with at any time that uh, spoke with a, a street style. So um, it, I just happen to have, someone called me once, an ax, I'm an accidental black. I'm accidentally black. <laughs> It's just that um, my skin coloring is what it is. My insides uh, are what they are. Um, I am a classic Oreo. I'm a card carrying Oreo and I will not apologize for it. It took years to get through that. For some black people, I am too white. So for some white people, I am too black. And that's all there is to it. Walked around saying, why didn't Aaron Copeland write more Jewish material? I mean, he doesn't sound Jewish. I mean, I haven't, I don't hear the horror in him. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't hear um, the, the, the Yiddish culture or whatever in him. Um, so uh, he did what he wanted to do at, without an apology. And that goes for Bernstein too. Bernstein had to step out of his jazz and blues thing, acquire his, his black style, but and occasionally when asked, he would write uh, in, a, in a, a, a piece that reflected on Jewish culture. So uh, I don't believe that a, an African-American has to reflect a particular stylistic bent. And so people come to the concert and they say, oh, this is why a black guy, this one is going to have jazz and blues and they going to walk out very disappointed because, oh my God, I heard an actual symphony with you know, the, the way the Europeans would have done it. Well, that's what I like. You don't like it, tough. Well, Candace, <laughs> this actually, this started out with him kind of like saying, I don't like your question, Stephanie, which Brian nicely cut out. <laughs> But it was based on your experience, Candace. Candace, you come from a, you do come from a black church, right? And you do come from that. And you've written a, a solo performance, which is the first, the way I met you, which is called Vox in a Box, which is a completely different uh, side of the story. And you want to talk a little bit about that? 
Sure. It, it was interesting when Adolphus was talking about his uh, experience growing up, his influences, there were some similarities and then there were some things that were almost like flipped opposite. So for me, I did grow up in the black church. And so the the black music idioms that come with the, the black church experience, those were definitely in my wheelhouse. Um, but at home, I was also hearing Barbara Streisand and Willie Nelson um, and Dinah Shore. So lots of different influences. Um, and then when it came to singing, for some reason, my voice couldn't do what I was hearing a lot of the African American um, artists on the radio doing. I just couldn't find my blues or jazz or soul. I just couldn't find it. Um, everything was pretty straight. Um, and, and my mom just allowed me to develop the voice that I had. And she would say, you know, don't hit the note so hard and all of that. So um, I came up singing more in what would eventually I would know it as the bel canto style. So even when I was singing Whitney Houston or um, whoever, Mariah Carey, I still had this, unbeknownst to me at the time, bel canto approach to the voice because my mom just had this um, sense that telling me to sing that way was what worked for my voice. Um, and then I started looking at classical music because I was in a national competition that thank you NAACP AXO. Um, you have this national competition to support high schoolers to get scholarship for college. And uh, there was an HBCU in my hometown and the, the professor of voice said to me, I want to help you get ready for this competition and I want to help you get ready for your auditions um, for college. I knew nothing about bel canto. I knew I I sang in chorus, you know, and I sang solos and I sang, I was like a little itinerant singer in, in church um, across, actually going across the state, but I didn't know classical music other than listening to the orchestral music at night when I wanted to go to sleep. Um, and so I began to be introduced to like one of the first arias I worked on was Rejoice um, from Handel's Messiah, Rejoice Greatly. And, uh, you know, my voice teacher at the time was saying, well, you know, I want, you, I want you to put it here and all of this stuff. And this is what I talk about in Vox in a Box, um, being asked to sing. He was trying to give me this vocal technique and I couldn't really get what he was saying. So then he just sat back and said, well, just sing the way I heard you singing when you were doing the hymn or the spiritual. <laughs> when I, the very first time I heard you sing and I was like, oh, okay. And that's when the wheel started to turn. And he said, your natural is classical. And then I was like, well, classical? Do black people sing classical? I don't know about that. And then family members started introducing me to people like uh, Kathleen Battle and Jesse Norman, Florence Kavar, um, and Barbara Hendricks, and then the list goes on. And um, and as I you know, took in that music and and seeing those faces and those bodies singing in this this way that I was being taught to sing, I began to find a home. But then I still had this other background, right? I still had this this gospel. I also listened to jazz. I still had this part of me that really wanted to improvise. So I'm I'm like, okay, I'm doing the Mozart and I learned how to write, you know, cadenzas, which is the improvisation for for Mozart, right? For Mozart's time, but when do I get to do that that other stuff that, you know, I hear Aretha Franklin doing? Isn't there some kind of way I get to do that too? And so for a long time, I was straddling the fence. You know, as an undergrad, I remember my voice teacher saying, oh, you can't sing both. You need to, you're, you have one foot in one place and another foot in the other. And your voice must be highly calibrated for classical singing. And you know, are you still singing that stuff, that gospel? Oh, who are you watching? You're doing strange, you know, so it was, it was all of that. And I felt like, oh, well, I better just leave the gospel alone, even though I couldn't sing it the way I wanted to sing it, but I still, I wanted to sing it because there was this germane, this innate sensibility somewhere deep inside of me that said, I need to improvise. I need to be off the page. And eventually I, um, as a master student, I came across Willis Patterson, 
who um, published the first anthology of African American art songs and had a, a large um, volume of songs by black composers. And he began to introduce me to one of them was Adolphus Hale Stork and his song cycle. And then as I start to get to know these composers, I'm starting to see that there are these black composers working squarely within the classical music idiom, but bringing in these elements of gospel and jazz and blues, the harmonies, opportunities for improvisation. And that's where I started to feel like, not only am I finding my home technically, but now I'm starting to feel like my heart is being fulfilled because I have the chance to do this thing, this improvisation, but do it in a, in a way that technically meets what my voice wants to do. Um, and so this black art song then gave me this new home. So I felt like I got to do it all. Um, and then with Fox in a Box, you know, there was another step after doing the, the Black Art Song, there was this other step that I needed to take. Uh, when I started working with Ben Flint, an amazing pianist here in the Bay Area, um, had toured with Isaac Hayes for a number of years. Um, and uh, it's a wonderful thing. He is a, a white pianist who is very, very steeped in class and in, in gospel in jazz um and and he was the pianist that i found who was able to give me the opportunity to step outside of the classical box and just really focus on improvisation and so sometimes we would just you know get together and we would look at a rug and we would say all right let's try to musically represent what we see on this rug so he would play and I would sing and we would try to sing and play the rug. And from that, we began to just develop a wonderful relationship. And then we started um, arranging some spirituals that really uh, fit my voice and my improvisational style. So then I have both the art song and then my own arrangements uh, with Ben of, of the, the Negro spiritual and then you know, we've even contemporized some of the spirituals, uh, doing them in a more, uh, let's say, contemporary soul way. Um, but still, I'm always coming from a base of bel canto with my voice because that's what I sing well. That's what feels natural to me. But getting the opportunity to dibble and dabble in all kinds of improvisatory um, expressions, that just delights me. Yes. And, you know, it's like... We have these similarities, Candace and I. I did a solo performance called Breed and Rescue, and it was just me and Ben Flint. Ah. This was a couple of years before I met Candace. And you know, <laughs> so I've had my experiences with Ben as well. Um, you, this is not the first time that you have sung the song cycle. Correct. Can you talk a little bit about this? Sure. Well, I, um, you know, when I was digging into it at, as a doctoral student, I did perform it for the first time um, as part of my dissertation recital sets. And then um, my pianist in Michigan just happened to move to Northern California at the same time that I moved here. So we were able to do the West Coast premiere of Ventriloquist Acts of God back in, I think that was 2006. And uh, I also had a chance around the same time, maybe within a year or so, had the opportunity to sing it live for Adolphus um, at UC Irvine at the biannual African American Art Song Alliance Conference. Um, and that's where the real dialogue with Adolphus started, where I got a chance to ask him. Uh, so what did you mean by this? And, you know, I see that you've got this, the G's written here in the melody and, you know, what does this mean? And what do you think about? And uh, yeah, so we just had some conversations there at the conference and then began to talk by email. And I was still digging into the music, trying to understand, you know, more about how he wrote. And it happened that as I was pulling out motific material from his song cycle, I said, now there are these three motives that recur throughout this, the cycle. Um, I don't know what, what these mean to you, but you know, can you tell me something? And so he said, well, you have found my signature. 
And I, what? <laughs> you know, this is like the musicologist, like <laughs> star moment. What? The, this is okay. But he wouldn't tell me which one. Today in the KALW interview, he gave me a little morsel more of information. Now I know what register this motive happens. So hopefully, not too long from now, I'll be able to identify it specifically. And then, you know, hey, I can publish a paper on that. <laughs> <laughs> you'll sing him, you'll write him, you'll do everything him, him, him. Yeah. So we now, why don't we, um, Adolphus talked about what it's, about you and your singing the acting side of me and the researcher and the singer get to all come together in this theater i i, I still say one of the finest performances if not the finest performance ventriloquist acts of god yeah, yeah. Uh, well the finest performance i ever heard of that really is the first one i heard candace do um uh, others have done it but she nailed it impeccably and with fervor and passion, just exactly what it needed. And uh, I, 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 I remember being quoted. I don't know if I sent it directly to her or not. I should have. And then I said, that's the, one of the finest performances of a piece of mine I ever heard. Because composers have to sit through many, many Grin and Barrett performances. And uh, to have someone get up there and do it so professionally was a special touch. I remember you're, you're teasing me and telling me I, 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 have, I, I have I have a love affair with high cheese. And, <laughs> and ever since that, I've been counting the G's. Uh, <laughs> and that, that, that taught me a big lesson that I needed to learn. And, and just don't write high notes for the sake of writing high notes because she's a soprano. Mm -hmm. so, uh, you, you sound like you're a wonderful teacher and you taught me that day. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, yeah, you are amazing. So that's all there is to that. <laughs> and I think, you know, kudos to you, Candace. And I know that for some reason you're doing it now. That was back in 2006, which is 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 years later now. And wow. lots of things have happened to you. Like you have your children now, right? <laughs> you didn't have back then, correct? Indeed. And you talked a little bit about the difference between then and now and you singing uh, this, this song cycle. Yes. Well, um, I sang them, of course, to my be the best of my ability in 2006 with all of the sensibilities and understandings that I had as a, as a person, as a woman. But um, having children just brings a new perspective to everything. Um, and then just growing as a person. So I would say there are two songs in particular that have probably a heightened sense of present now than 15 years ago. So um, one is, um, it's called Fire, and it's it's very fiery. It has a, a wonderful bluesy kind of opening with a fugue-like um, motive, and then um, just bursts into flames with the, the soprano, with the voice singing super high and doing all these, these color term, these melismatic passages. Um, but it's not that part that I'm singing so much differently. It's the this, this sense of passion, sensuality, um, desire that I think I just bring maybe a little bit more maturity to um, now than I did back then. And then the other piece is, um, it has the same kind of energy, but it's much more primal, um, and that is the true story of Adam and Eve, which is piece number four. Um, there is this moment where the woman, so the true story of Adam and Eve, there, there's the talk about, you know, nature around, the man is mentioned, and then the woman enters. And how Hale Stork responds to the woman entering the world um, says a lot, I think, about what he wanted to say about women um really even musically like literally 
in the melody lifted that text up. Um, I think it was a perfect fourth higher than when the man entered the world. Um, and, and she just has this big, broad moment. It is the broadest moment in the piece. Um, and the words the, the poet has there say self-hatched as from a shell. So she was self-hatched. She wasn't, nobody took her shell and broke it for her so she could come out. She, she hatched herself. And so that sense of, you know, coming out, making, having a choice and, and deciding to step forward. Um, I think I have a much greater appreciation for what that means as a woman now than I did 2006. So, so go, getting back to this piece that we're going to hear by Candace, Ventriloquist, wow. Acts of God. Tell us a little bit about what went into writing that and why you, you know, who did you write it for a singer? Was it written for? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a, a gal on the, on the staff at uh, Old Dominion where I just retired from. And um, she has a, a friend of hers who's a poet and said, would you set this poem? And I went, okay. And the poem was called Ventriloquist Acts of God. I wrote it and she liked it so much. She said, would you consider uh, writing some more songs and turning into a cycle? And that's what I did. And I had a lot of fun doing it. And I always, I always have fun writing for Sopranos because, you know, someone said, well, why haven't you written any, why haven't you written more stuff for mezzo soprano? I said, mezzos don't talk to me. It's always Sopranos to talk to me. So I can't help it. That's the way it is. <laughs> so in the poetry, how does it inspire you? Like what, what, you know, when you look at something that inspires you to be sung, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Here's, uh, in my teaching, uh, it was a five semester term uh, course. And the third semester I devoted totally to writing for the human voice uh, because most composers do not get that subject. They, how to write for voice is a uniquely challenging uh, aspect of, of Western music that is, is, is different from writing for piano, which most people go in the composition, they start out in piano. They know piano. They don't know voices. They didn't sing in the choir. They, they you know, they might date if they're lucky, date a uh, soprano. But uh, <laughs> that doesn't mean they learn how to write for her voice. But uh, it's well, anyway. When, so anyway, in my course, I go into uh, how do you pick a text. Is it a good text for a, a man's voice or a woman's voice? What's the peak of the uh, text? What's the point of the text? Where does the uh, voicing change? Where does it change from first person, second person, or third person? Uh, all of that has to go into that. Um, what's the best meter in which to write it? Um, what are the good vowel sounds, and especially which vowel sounds that would be used on high notes, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's what I do. That's how I write. I love writing for the human voice and I've spent a lot of time doing it. Uh, so that's what goes into it. Now, um, the, 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 what's the emotional content of the poem? What's the poem about? That's it. Um, what's the main point that, that, that the author has in it? Uh, does it end sadly? Does it end happily? Um, there's a, a piece I just wrote for a chorus, the Dayton Bach Society. And uh, they, they sent me a, a batch of, they're celebrating Dunbar who came from Dayton and asked me uh, which one did I like? And one of the ones they sent was the Sparrow. Now you'd think that a, a poem about a sparrow would be a happy-go-lucky, uh, nothing to it. The, 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 the sparrow flutters down, dazzle you with, with its acrobatics in the air or whatever. And um, uh, then uh, maybe, you know, you, that's it. You had a cheerful encounter with the sparrow. But the way Dunbar said that, <laughs> the sparrow came, comes down, sits on the windsill, windowsill, chirps away like mad, and it gets, gets no, totally neglected by the poet. The poet's too busy working. And the, char the, the sparrow notices that he's being neglected. And so the sparrow just says, well, I'm out of here and takes off and 
it's only later on that the poet realized that he missed a, a great opportunity to spend some time listening to this beautiful little sparrow. And, uh, and so it actually ends kind of softly and sadly uh, because uh, the point that Dunbar was making as we work so hard all the time uh, and in drudgery a lot of times, he says plodding on and plodding on that we forget to take time just to listen to a bird sing. And uh, eventually the bird just takes off after feeling neglected. This, uh, it, it, when you see the trajectory, see it says this emotional trajectory, it starts with the word flutter, the bird comes flutter. So I took that as my point of departure because I love that word, flutter, flutter, flutter. So I have the whole choir, uh, especially the upper voices singing flutter and in and, and very, uh, that kind of chord and they overlap and, and all of that. And um, then, and, and there's supposed to be a soprano soloist with it too. And she comes in and she's up, uh, up there. And so, um, but anyway, <laughs> that's, the, that's how I was touched by it. I was touched by the language, the three different things I'm touched by. The language, the meaning of the poem, uh, the trajectory of the poem, uh, all of those go into uh, making, to me, a good piece of vocal art. <sighs> Boy, does he know what he's doing. <laughs> so, it was his decision. You came up with an idea. We talked about it. Um, we do this uh, Black composer art songs. And then we had to work on making it real. Right. And one of the first kind of interesting story is the pianist, which is happens to be my cousin, Mark Shapiro. And you know, he's a pianist for the San Francisco Symphony. I do not know my cousin. We grew up in the same town. We went to the same elementary and high school and all that together, but we weren't close. It didn't matter that we were cousins. I just knew he was my cousin. All I remembered was one day walking down in fifth grade and seeing him play Boogie Woogie on the piano in the hallway. And that left a huge, huge uh, image in my mind of him. So anyway, uh, some weeks ago, because of the digital world, I'm on a show and it turns out they were doing a show, half was about the marsh on KLW and half was about this memorial they were doing for the San Francisco pianist who had just, who had recently died. And they said, well, Mark Shapiro will be playing. And so I'm in the chat saying, that's, that's my cousin. And the producer said, you want me to, I said, but I don't know him. And then so you want us to hook you up? And I said, yes. So we. We had a long talk and I kind of, we talked on Zoom and I couldn't figure out how he, I couldn't even get a good lesson in Newburgh, but he managed to become the pianist for the San Francisco <laughs> Symphony. And what happens to us young kids who are already in a little upstate New York town with no resources and no parents who know what to do with us. And we had this wonderful discussion and out of it, it came that, you know, well, if you ever have a project that you might, you know, want to work on, I'm, I'm loose right now, you know, everything's shut down. So when Candace talked to me about this project, I said, well, why don't I call my cousin and see if he will play the piano? And that's what's happened. Oh, yes. And I'm so glad you suggested that. Um, you know, Adolphus writes with um, such sensitivity, um, sensitivity to the text. And um, he's quite specific about um, t in, uh, the dynamic markings um, and um, there's another word that I'm looking for, but he just he's very specific. So it's there's generally not a question what he's asking for the musicians and singers to do, um, but to have someone who really can respond to what's on the page, and then also there so there's the being able to accurately respond to what's on the page, but there's also the sense of feel. And uh, Mark never failed to get a sense of the feel in each piece. 
And um, I didn't know, you know, when you're working with someone, I didn't know about his background playing boogie woogie, but when you're working with someone who primarily sits in the, the classical repertoire, when you are being asked to play um, a line that is full of blues, uh, rhythm and, and melody, um, you don't know how authentically they'll be able to sit in that. But I find him able to just, he can go here and he can go there and he can just do it seamlessly. And so that was really wonderful um, to be able to experience that with him. And he's also very meticulous. He understands what the voice should be doing um, with the piano, how the two are married. Um, and, uh, you know, even had me, I, I thought I was really, really, really careful with e dotting every uh, I and crossing every T rhythmically speaking. And he brought out a couple of things and I said, oh, wow, I missed that. So that's always wonderful, you know, to, for your game to be upped by the other, the other musicians in the room. So this, tell us a little bit about what this performance is going to be like. There's two aspects to it. So right so i think um i was trying to figure out what is the best way to describe what i'm doing and i think it's like a theatrical lecture recital sort of right so we have um the the music has been pre-recorded so as to preserve the quality of uh, the sound but so we are playing we play one song at a time and then the songs are discussed Yes, so I play the part of, one part is I play the part of the professor who is sharing the music with the class, and then each student has a response to the music that they've been um, interfacing with, both in class and outside of class, spending some time with the music and, and trying to make sense of it within the context of the music that they're already um, experiencing, whether it be formal or informal um, music experience. And um, so there's a bit of, you know, biography about, I play Hale Stork as well. So I, I, I am talking as Hale Stork about um, his life, but then the, the students in the class are, are discussing these things that they're hearing and, and experiencing in the music. Um, so just to, you know, give a little uh, preview into, uh, the characters there is um, a Chinese student, uh, she's Chinese, an international student um, who experiences the music a certain way and certainly really, really gets into the text. Um, there is an African American male student from Vallejo, um, from the hood, um, who says some very brilliant and profound things that he sees in the music. Um, and then there, my I think the character that is just most special to my heart is the deaf student um, who teaches us how to experience music um, with a much more keenly attuned um, sense of awareness. Can you do a little snip of, a, of any of those characters for us now? Well, I want to tell you about the song fire uh no actually i think i will focus my time on the true story of adam and eve you see this music is uh it is like the composer was making a statement about women's lib it was like when i look at the page i say oh my goodness this is one moment of history and one moment of the contemporary movement of women's lip it's like me too is in this moment on the page it is music but it is now and i am so uh the word is uh, overtaken i was overtaken by the moment in the music when the woman steps forward and i i am a pianist uh, uh but my parents want me to be engineer because I I have ability to understand math and science very well but to my heart I want to play music I want to play music I like to sing as well and I do it on the side but I say I'm going to take this class because I really want to step out of the box uh, that that my family put 
on top of me, you know, and I say, I am going to come out like the woman in the song. The composer made a wonderful statement by taking her moment and lifting it up melodically higher than every, anything else in the in the piece. It's one moment that stands out above everything else. And I said, oh, that really touched my heart. And I said, if I can stand out like that in myself, I can stand out. I can stand out above what my parents say, above what society say I am supposed to be and I can be what really matters to me. That to me is why we are here. That is what this class is all about. It's about finding ourselves, finding our voices and stepping out. And so I just want to say, Professor, to you, thank you for this opportunity because I feel that I grow as a student. I come out in a way that, uh, uh, if I was still back at home in China, I would not have this opportunity. So to you, I say, Xin Xin. <laughs> Candice, you're amazing. You can sing an opera and you can <laughs> act and improv amazingly well. It's just amazing to watch you do all this stuff. How do Thank you, you. Candice, how do you do it? <laughs> I don't know. I think, you know, it's been like groomed all along. I have a brother. He's, I don't know. I guess he's watching because I see his wife, I see my sister on. Um, but I have a, a brother who, uh, there was, all of my siblings are older than I am, like old enough to be my parents. Um, but there was one who was still in, at home and in the hometown where I was growing up. And he's a pianist and a singer. And he would come, come over and we would sit at the piano and he would tell me these stories, but he wouldn't just tell them. He would like play the background on the piano, you know, making the soundtrack on the piano. And then he would tell me these stories and he would sing some of it and then he would talk some of it. So this, you know, this is like theater at home. Um, and uh, he is also a poet. Um, I think all of my siblings are musical in some way. Um, so the sense of, of theater and drama was a part of, of what I had in at home growing up. Um, and then I got involved in theater, you know, just, you know, community theater um, in elementary school. And then by high school was doing, you know, lead roles in, in the local theater company. Um, so that's been there. And I've just always loved, I, I hear, right? I hear, I think for those of us who really like to do character work, um, I feel like we've been gifted with an ear to be able to hear um, language, how how words, how languages sit inside of the mouth. That's something I love to share with my students when I'm teaching. So if we're working on Italian, we have to understand where where does Italian live? It lives in the front of the mouth, like the consonants have to be falling off, off of the lips. Um, but if we were going to do German, then you know it's going to be further back, and and if it is if it's a Russian, you know it's going to be even further back and down. But it's also got even this, even in Russian, there's this sense of a little height and and some romance, uh, some romance or a Latin sensibility somewhere in the language. So it's all of these things like hearing this and just playing around, like having friends that I can just. It. And Catherine Keats, in fact, in our in our solo performance music workshop, um, we've gotten on the phone before on Zoom, and we just so you know, what are you thinking about today? We just go into character, you know, and then sometimes you know we just like just talk like like this, you know, and we just we like to experience different characters in our mouths and in our bodies, and we just like to say who some of these people are, you know, and. And then you know what I'm saying is just like you just be going from one person to the next and you know because uh, I know a lot of people that talk like this because I grew up, you know, around a lot of different kind of black people and I can do Ebonics and I can speak this way. And so, you know, it's just all over the place. It's just, it's fun. It's fun to me. And I'm glad that you give me the opportunity to do work in such a fun way. <laughs> well, the work with you is fantastic. I know part of this is so much about you teaching a class in a way and the students that you are impacted by. I mean, it's like, talk a little bit about, I mean, when I listen to these characters that you're building, it's just amazing to see the impact of working on this art song and how it's, how it's opening up their heart and souls to worlds, worlds they probably never imagined. 
Well, it's interesting. Um, so, so a lot of what I'm bringing um, in the characters, these are moments that I've had in the actual classroom. So from the vocal lessons that I teach one-on-one, -on -one, the, um, the group classes, the voice classes that I have, where I have usually 20, 25 students in a class. Um, and then every now and then uh, there's funding for this, this class on the African-American composer. Um, and I, so in that particular class, it's a seminar, so we didn't have a lot of students. So we had a lot, a lot of opportunity to have really deep dialogue. And um, it was really important for me to make sure that the students were able to connect to, you know, classical music in a way that would make it not seem so foreign, that it would be approachable, accessible. And so I had them respond to some of the things that they had encountered um, in, in the Black uh, American art song. In, and I covered not just art song, but also instrumental work. Um, so I had them respond to it in a medium uh, that was germane to them. So some of them painted, some of them wrote poetry, some of there was even a sculptor. So just to ha have the opportunity to take something that may seem like, oh, that's classical up, oh, that's so far over there. Who's even listening to that music anymore? But just to bring it close and make it where it's it's not foreign. We take we can take the foreign language out of it. We can take the lofty words and and bring them a little bit closer. And I can help you see that probably what's in this music is there's something in it that you've already been exposed to. And the music that you're listening to every day, the music that you grew up hearing in your home, there's something that we can connect with. And that's um, a passion that I have. And so I think that's what I'm trying to do also in, th in the show is to bring connection. So it's about connecting with the music and through connecting with the music, these characters begin to connect with one another and build community. And I'm hoping that then, you know, it, as we watch the show, that people will begin to have dialogue outside of the Marsh stream and say, oh, you know, I heard this and and they'll start to build community. And then we've got this this wonderful constellation of of networks that happen as a result of sharing this music. Hi, I am Candace Johnson and I am delighted to be sharing this new show, Music to My Ears, hearing Adolphus Hale Stork. So much of what this show is about has come from experiences that I've had in the classroom teaching. In this, this show, um, it is set in a classroom, in a UC Berkeley music classroom, and I play the part of the professor who's sharing this song cycle, a song cycle by the composer Adolphus Hale Stork called Ventriloquist Acts of God. The students in the classroom begin to listen. They listen not only to the music, but they listen to each other. So this story is about music. It's about community. It's about um, biography and a celebration of the beauty of words.